Good afternoon. My name is Kim Goff. I'm a learning program developer here at the Royal BC Museum. And on behalf of this afternoon's speakers, I would like to acknowledge the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations on whose traditional territories we work and where we're gathered for today's Spring Institute. A little bit about the format for the Spring Institute for those of you who weren't here this morning. Including to today, there are two days of public of programs, with the second day being tomorrow, both in the morning and afternoon. There are four presenters in each segment who speak for 10 minutes each. We'll ask you to save your questions for the presenters until all four presenters have spoken, and then we will do a, a group Q&A. During the lunch hour and this afternoon, there are staff engagement tables out in Clifford Carl Hall. After the Q&A today, we have a very special guest. Alphonse Umalisa, director of the National Museums of Rwanda, will address us uh, for, uh, about his work. And uh, so it'll be very interesting. We hope you'll stay uh, at 2.45 when that starts. So although we encourage you to put your phones on silent, uh, I also welcome you to tweet or share on social media anything you hear today. We'll share those um, hashtags at the end. You are welcome, of course, also to get up and to leave at any point during the talks today. Washrooms are just down, available at the end of the hall. Our theme for this afternoon is collections. If you aren't a collector, you probably know someone who is. When I was a kid, my aunt said to me, it would be a lot easier to buy you gifts if I knew what you collected. So I just thought about that for a couple minutes, and I said, turtles. I collect turtles. And it began. Humans are unique in the way that we collect items purely for the satisfaction of seeking and owning them. While my motivation was greed uh, for more presents, there are many more reasons for building a collection. We may collect things simply because we like them, or we wish to preserve the past, or perhaps we even think they're investments to those of you who might collect wine or coins out there. We may collect things. Um, it's even possible that having a collection in your youth can foster social connections develop organizational thinking, or even awaken a desire for more knowledge. Collecting can be good for you, and it can help build an identity. Our speakers this afternoon are going to share their research based on the collections of the Royal BC Museum and Archives. The collections of the Royal BC Museum and Archives hovers at around 7 million objects, specimens, and records. This is an awe-inspiring number. But please, don't think of this as a storage site. As our speakers will show you, these uh, records and collections are active. They're consulted by curators, historians, researchers, scientists, both near and far. Our first speaker today is senior conservator Casey Lee. Casey did collect dolls when she was a child, but a flood in the basement put an end to that and maybe even influenced her career to become a conservator. Please welcome Casey. Good afternoon. While society is grappling with the problem of deteriorating plastics in our oceans, landfills, and even biological organisms, museum conservators are desperately looking for ways to save plastic artifacts from self-destruction. This research project explores various strategies for preserving two of the most fugitive plastics in our human history collection, cellulose nitrate and cellulose acetate. It comes at a critical time when we are planning for modernization of our facilities, including improved preservation environments for our collections. There are generally three types of plastic uh, film-based photographic materials, cellulose nitrate, ce cellulose acetate, and polyester. Cellulose nitrate, often called nitrocellulose, celluloid, or nitrate film, has been used in photography since the 1840s. Nitrate film remained in production in various formats until the early 1950s. Unfortunately, the film was, and is, highly flammable. Deteriorating nitrate film has caused several disastrous fires, the most famous being the 1937 Little Fairy, New Jersey fire that destroyed every single 20th century Fox silent film produced before 1932. Many destructive fires have occurred elsewhere, such as the one pictured here at Henderson's Film Labs in London as recently as 1993. Due to the inherent instability of cellulose nitrate, much of our film legacy from this period has disappeared. 
Beginning in the mid-1920s, cellulose acetate film, known as safety film, was developed to replace nitrate film. Although it's not likely to spontaneously combust, cellulose acetate is also chemically unstable. It becomes acidic, shrinks, and gives off acetic acid, producing a vinegary odor. This is the basis of the term vinegar syndrome. Most of our Royal BC Museum collections of unstable film and photographic materials have been moved into freezers to preserve the originals. At the same time, the content of these films has been, and continues to be, reformatted onto more stable polyester film to ensure that the public has access to copies of these early treasures. Cellulose nitrate has been used for molded plastic objects since the 1870s. It was often colored and patterned to look like tortoiseshell or ivory, the synthetic version being known as French ivory. The same chemical deterioration can be expected for three-dimensional cellulose nitrate objects, but at a much slower rate than it is for film. Instead of spontaneous combustion, they merely crack, crumble, and eventually turn to dust all the while exuding acidic vapors that corrode, discolored, and uh, erode nearby objects. Cellulose acetate was synthesized in 1865 and was commonly used in the 20th century for buttons, eyeglasses, playing cards, and toys, including all Lego bricks made between 1949 and 1963. Many of these objects now exhibit cracking, shrinkage, and distortion, as well as discoloration and surface deposits of white crystals. Incidentally, Lego switched over to ABS plastic in 1963 after complaints that many of their bricks no longer fit together. We face the very real possibility of losing an entire cross-section of our 19th and 20th century material culture, including dolls, combs, jewelry, drafting angles, cutlery tools, early electronics, and toys. We can't just reformat or copy these onto a more stable medium, as, as can be done for film. Recent advancements in 3D scanning might be used to make a copy of an artifact, but even these are currently made using fugitive plastics. And the public is really more inter interested in seeing the original artifact anyway. Rather than serving as an information carrier, as is in the case of film, the value of an artifact lies in its form. We have to find a way to arrest the deterioration of these plastics, or at least stabilize them while retaining physical access. Typically, storage of mixed museum collections involves low light levels, constant relative humidity and temperature, cushioning against physical stress and protection from dust, water, and pollutants. Several of the early plastics and many of the more recent plastics are quite stable under these conditions. Cellulose nitrate and acetate storage requires a different approach. Existing preservation strategies for these plastics are based on monitoring the collection for signs of deterioration, and then segregating any deteriorating plastics that might emit acidic vapors. Unfortunately, when deterioration is visible, or you can smell it sometimes, it's usually too late to save an artifact. Decomposition is swift and irreversible. This has occurred in the past. In the RBCM Modern History Collection, notably with the drafting angles, but also involving hair combs, scissors, buttons, and purses. Even a shower cap was reduced to what looks like tiny scraps of paper. We rarely deaccession objects because they are in such poor condition that they have lost all value, but these items represent a few examples of this unfortunate loss. Every museum in the world is experiencing this dilemma. It's conceivable that there will be not a single example left of early 20th century French ivory dresser sets or cutlery in a short period of time. So we have to isolate and work to preserve these cellulose nitrate and acetate artifacts in our care. Because the deterioration process is autocatalytic, the first object to begin de deteriorating will release gases that cause all other plastic artifacts in that area to suffer as well. But if the objects are individually wrapped or boxed, their demise is accelerated as the acidic gases build up in the enclosure. Several solutions are being explored, including storage at low temperatures and relative humidity, storage in enclosures with adsorbents such as zeolites or activated charcoal to remove acidic off-gases, and storage with ventilation. Visiting researcher Joanne Peters from Western Washington University 
carried out a survey of the modern history of plastics. She used chemical spot tests to identify 133 cellulose nitrate and 30 cellulose acetate artifacts in the collection. These objects included drafting angles, hairpins and combs, mirrors, toothbrushes, manicure sets, perfume bottles, trays, pill boxes, fans, shoehorns, button hook handles, and screwdrivers. <laughs> the first phase of this multi-year project that I will be working on entails completing the identification of all cellulose nitrate and cellulose acetate in the Modern History Collection through chemical spot tests, that is, using indicator solutions that change color when in contact with specific uh, plastic samples. Chemical spot testing is inexpensive, reasonably quick, and minimally destructive. This slide illustrates the use of diphenylamine blue indicator to test for cellulose nitrate. Phase two of the research will compare the impact of eight different storage environments on each of five representative cellulose nitrate and five cellulose acetate artifacts identified during the spot testing phase. Our research partner at the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa will take minute samples of these artifacts to confirm their chemical makeup and also to track their deterioration through instrumental analysis and molecular weight measurements. The proposed storage environments for the second phase of this research will include both cold storage and room temperature storage. In each of the two environments, objects will be placed on open shelves to facilitate ventilation, as well as in containers with silica gel, zeolite, and activated charcoal adsorbents to remove acidic gases and to reduce the relative humidity. The plastic artifacts will be placed into their temporary storage environments for one year, after which the adsorbents will be checked for efficacy, observations made of indicators, and samples taken to monitor deterioration. Since it's possible that there will be no little to no observable deterioration in some of the environments after one year, the objects will be placed back into their environments for a second year of storage after which a final round of testing will be undertaken. Deterioration will be tracked using test paper indicator strips, as well as observation of unbuffered archival tissue beneath the objects. Nitric acid associated with the deterioration of cellulose nitrate objects is known to discolor tissue that is in contact with the artifact. Deterioration will be measured by quantitative analysis, similar to that done at the beginning of the testing by scientists at the Canadian Conservation Institute. It's hoped that the information gained through this research will enable immediate decisions around reorganization of RBCM modern history collection storage so that the remaining collections will be preserved. If this can be accomplished without moving large parts of the collection into inaccessible cold storage, then we will have found a method of mitigating the problem while facilitating access to the collection. This would be the best possible outcome. Whatever the findings, this information will come at a critical time during the planning for modernization of the Royal BC Museum facilities. Beyond the walls of the RBCM, this research will help to guide the plastic artifact preservation practices of all museums. Perhaps there are opportunities to pool our resources and promote sustainable solutions to the problem. This research may have a profound effect on what can be saved for future generations. Thank you. <laughs>